Well, uh, let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, looking at verses 18 through 39. A Bible study I've entitled, The Love of God. The Love of God. Now, last week we looked at the first half of Romans 8, and we looked at how Paul was declaring the spiritual freedoms that we have in Christ Jesus. And these freedoms that we enjoy, not on our own merit, but because of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so today, as we continue the second half of Romans chapter 8, again, we could call this chapter the Christian's Declaration of Freedom. And so Romans chapter 8 is one of my favorite in the book of Romans. Um, And really, uh, it's kind of broken out in two different sections in verses 18 through 39. Uh, The first is our freedom from discouragement and despair. And that's in verses 18 through 30. And the second is our freedom from fear and our freedom uh, from having this fear of the separation from God. And that's in verses 31 through 39. Now, last week we left off uh, reading and concluding with verse 17, and we didn't really touch on one of the subjects there, and that's kind of why we're going to bridge into that this morning. Um, And so the latter half of verse 17 says, If indeed we suffer with Him, that's Jesus, that we may also be glorified together. So this is really a bridge into our section today. And Paul's going to address and deal with this very real problem of pain and suffering. And as I was thinking about that subject, I asked the question, well, why does God allow suffering and hard times in our lives? And I came up with a a quick list of seven. This isn't a complete list. This is just kind of what came to my mind as I was jotting them down. The first is that sometimes God allows suffering and hard times to humble us. So that we won't rely and trust in ourselves. And sometimes it's to help us to produce more fruit as we seek the Lord. Sometimes it's to show us where our faith is placed and prove the reality of our faith. Sometimes it's to allow us uh, to comfort others uh, with the comfort that we can only have and only that Jesus brings. He's our hope. And yet sometimes it's to put our thoughts on heaven and prepare our hearts more for eternity. Uh, Sometimes uh, suffering and hard times are a result of our own bad choices. And we we learn the hard way. We want to avoid that as much as possible, but sometimes that's the reality. um, That we can can bring things on ourselves. And then lastly, sometimes God allows suffering and hard times in our lives... Because he can use it to make us more like Jesus. And really that's everything in our lives. If we allow him to, uh, God can use anything in our lives. Uh, But we need to allow him to use that to transform us to become more like Christ. Um, And so maybe something tragic has happened to you lately. Maybe the death of a a loved one. um, Or some bad news from a doctor. uh, Maybe a a close brush with death. um, Or maybe it's something else that's gotten your attention um, and you hurt. Perhaps your marriage has failed, uh, your parents divorced, or you got fired from your job suddenly and and you're looking at God and you're saying, Why me, Lord? Why now? What is going on? Um, Why is this happening? And as Christians, we need to remember that God is in control of all the events in our life. That God is sovereign. He knows the end from the, from the very beginning. And that He can use these trials to show us not only what we're made of, right, to show us where our faith is placed, if it's placed in ourselves or in Him, um, but he'll, he'll show us how we react. And people react in different ways to crisis. I've seen that people either turn to God when they're going through a crisis and they, they realize that He's their only hope and they, they lean and trust in on Him. Others, they become angry and bitter at God and turn their back on God. And, and, and in essence... Um, are cutting off the only hope uh, that, that they have in this life. So when we go through trials, suffering or hard times, we need to turn to God for our hope. Again, non-believers, non-believers will turn against Him. Um, and you can remember it this way, the end result on how you respond to crisis and, and, and trials in your life is that it's either going to make you bitter or better. You're going to become bitter at God and bitter at the world 
or you're going to realize that God's in control and He's making you stronger and better. He's making you become more like Christ through the circumstances. So we get to choose how we respond. It's your choice. Suffering does not create character. It simply reveals it. Uh, And that's because a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. A lot of people have faith in things. You know, if you've got faith in that chair that you're sitting on, uh, that's one thing. But before you sat on that chair, um, you had faith that it was going to support you. It was going to hold your weight. Um, And so our faith needs to be tested as well. And, And it can be trusted because it's in the Lord. And it reminds us of that, that our faith is not in ourselves, but our our faith, our trust is in God. And you also need to know that when you go through hard times in your life, that God can use it to comfort others. And you have a special measure of comfort to someone else who is going through a, a time of suffering. Perhaps you know of someone who just found out they have cancer, and you're a cancer survivor. You can bring comfort into that situation like no one else can. I can't reach that person in the same way, but maybe you can. Perhaps you know someone else who who found out that their child is dying or has died, and you've already been down that road. Um, You can come alongside it and bring hope and comfort and peace to that situation. You can speak truth to that person's life uh, more than anyone else can because you've been there. You've experienced. You You can walk along with them in this journey. And you can offer the, the comfort that the Lord has given you when you went through your trial. So, God tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 5, that He comforts us and all our troubles so that we can comfort others. So, when others are troubled, we will be able to give them that same comfort that God has given us. And the truth is that God will give you what you need, when you need it. He doesn't give you the comfort before you go through that trial. He doesn't give you that comfort after you've gone through that trial. He gives it to you as you're in that trial, as you're in that storm. Uh, He gives it to us when we need it. And that reminded me of a a story from a gal named Corrie Ten Boom. If you don't know who she is, I encourage you to uh, read about her. Uh, she's got a great book called The Hiding Place. Uh, she survived being in prison for helping the Jews during the Holocaust. And in one of her books, she shared this story. She said, When I was a little girl, I went to my father and I said, Daddy, I'm afraid that I will never be strong enough to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. Tell me, her, said her father, When you take a trip to Amsterdam, when do I give you the money for the ticket? Three weeks before? No, Daddy. You give me the money for the ticket just before we get on the train. That's right, her father said. And so it is with God's strength. Our Father in Heaven knows when you will need the strength to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. He will supply all you need just in time. Oh, we may not be called to be martyrs for Jesus Christ, but we're all going to go through suffering in this life. And God will give us the strength that we need just in time. I've heard it said before that you're either going into a trial, you're in the midst of a trial, or you're coming out of a trial. And so if you're not in the midst of a trial, count yourself blessed. (laughs) Rejoice in the Lord, uh, because another one may be on its way. Um, So God God is uh, there for us, and He loves us, and He'll give us the strength that we need just in time. And so in verses 18 through 30, Paul deals with this very real problem of pain and suffering. And as I was thinking about how to really go through this text, I thought perhaps the best way is to understand the section, uh, to note these three groans that he discusses. And so there's this creation, all that all of creation is groaning. Uh, Then he mentions that we believers are groaning. And then lastly, the Holy Spirit that he's given inside of us is groaning as well. So we'll take a look at each of those. Uh, So Romans chapter 8, let's pick up in verse 18 and, and read through verse 22. And we read, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. 
For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. We'll pause there. So he mentions here that creation groans. Why does creation groan? Well, when God finished his creation, if you remember in Genesis chapter 1, he said it was very good. It wasn't just good, it was very good. Everything was perfect, right? And then what happened? Well, Adam sinned and let sin into our world and blew it in Genesis chapter 3. And creation started groaning at that point. Uh, It went from perfection to a fallen creation. And uh, when we look at the world around us today, we see it's full of suffering and pain and death. And that's the result of Adam's sin. Um, and yet we can look at the, the nature that God has created around us and we see it's very beautiful. But it's still fallen. Uh, trees and animals, they still die. There's still uh, cancer. There's still all these things in, in, in our world that are fallen. Um, And yet, that's not how it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be even more beautiful than the nature that we see. Uh, And so, creation is groaning. It's crying out. And what's interesting is that this groaning is compared to a woman during labor when there is pain. And uh, that is some some intense pain. (laughs) But the pain goes away only after the child is delivered. Um, And one day, creation too will be delivered. And it's going to be a, a glorious new creation. We're told in, in the epistle of Peter, um, in Second Peter, that all the elements are going to burn away with fervent heat and that God is going to start over with this world. He's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. And so all the old things will pass away and everything will become new. And that's what creation is crying out for. It's groaning for it, it is to be made new, to be redeemed. Um, and so we realize that, that creation is crying out for, for this newness. Now, I want to go back to verse 18 for a second because uh, this is a, a very interesting verse. Paul says, For I consider that sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And I, when I first read it, I thought, Say, what, Paul? Are you serious? That the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which will be revealed in us. And then I was reminded of what he also said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. He said, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So how could Paul make a statement like this? That, hey, all the suffering, all the stuff we're going through, it's, it's not even compared to really compare it to what lies ahead of us. I think Paul could really say this after he's gone through beatings and shipwrecks and flogging and imprisonment um, because he knows uh, that heaven is going to be glorious. And he's got his eyes fixed on Jesus. And that's what we need. We need to fix our, our eyes on Jesus too. And he knows that the eternal heaven is waiting for him. If you recall when Stephen, the first Christian martyr after Christ ascended back into heaven, was being martyred, being pelted with those stones, uh, he looked up to heaven and he said, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. Now some will argue and say, well see, it says he's sitting at the right hand of the Father and here he's standing. Uh, My personal take is I believe Jesus is standing to receive him. Saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on up here. <laughs> and, and, and sure enough, Stephen went up to heaven. He went to, to join our Lord in heaven. And so we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, on the eternal. Uh, the creation around us is groaning. And the next thing that Paul's going to mention here is that us as believers, we groan as well. And so let's take a look at that here in verses 23 through 25. And we read, Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, 
We eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We'll pause there. So he mentions that as believers, we groan. Why? We're waiting for the redemption of, of our bodies, right? He's purchased us, um, but we're awaiting that. And you can kind of think of it like this. If you went into a art um, gallery and you were going to purchase a piece of artwork, well, you can't usually just go and purchase that right there and then and take it out. You have to go and you, and you pay for it, and then they put uh, a sticker or, or some sort of notification on that artwork, sold, right? And this is, but this has been purchased. This is not for sale. You can look at it, but this has already been purchased. This has already been, been acquired. And that, in his essence, what God has done with us is, is he's left us here to be a light for him. That people would look at us and go, man, that's an artwork of God. That God is changing and transforming that person. So he's, he's placed his seal upon us with his Holy Spirit. But he hasn't picked us back up yet. And that'll happen either at the rapture or when he calls us home individually. So that's what we're awaiting. That's what we're groaning within us. Is Lord, come quickly. And if you've ever prayed for the rapture to happen, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Lord, please come. Uh, we're, we're desiring for you to take us home. And so um, this is that thrilling sequel to the adoption that took place at our conversion. right? The spirit of adoption brought us into God's family. So when we become born again, when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, at that very moment, uh, the Bible says we become born again. We receive God's Holy Spirit inside of us, seals us forever. We can never lose our salvation. But then he's, he's left us here to, to be light for him and for a purpose as well. And so that's what we're, we're desiring. And Paul wrestled with it. He said, you know, I, I have this desire to depart and go to heaven, uh, which is far greater, but then I also have this desire to stay here and equip you guys and help the church. And that's what he was struggling with. And, you know, uh, I'm glad he stayed for our sake because he wrote more letters to encourage us through the Lord. Yet his desire was, I want to go to heaven. I want to, want to be with my Savior and my Lord. Um, and so we look forward to that new body from God that we'll get in heaven. Because one day we'll finally be in a body that's in harmony with the spirit that God's given us. Um, and, and I'm in my 30s, but I realize the older I get, this body's not meant to last forever. Uh, it starts breaking down and does odd things you didn't think it could do. And, um, you know, as having kids now, I realize my, my back and my legs aren't as, my knees aren't as strong as they once were. So um, God's going to give us a new body, and an upgraded version, if you will, that'll last forever. A body that will never decay, never break down, uh, that'll never have aches and pains and soreness. A body that um, will never have cancer. A body that will never bleed again. A body that will endure. And possibly even a body that's similar to Jesus, where we could walk through walls. I'm not sure, but there'll be a lot in heaven that we'll look forward to. But we groan, we desire for this. And so we wait and we hope. We wait until the Lord comes and we hope that it will come soon, right? That he takes us home soon. And in Titus 2.13, it tells us that the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's telling us that that's, that's what we're looking for. We're looking forward to this, this reality of Jesus Christ coming. Um, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we're reminded through this that the best is yet to come. I know somebody wrote a book that you could have your best life now, um, but our best life is in heaven. If this is the best life that I'll ever have is here, man, heaven's going to be not much more fun. But if this is my life now and, and it is getting better because the Lord is using me and, and changing me and giving me more peace and joy, and heaven is an eternal bliss of that, man, I'm looking forward to heaven. There's no sin. There's no suffering. It's perfection. So the best is yet to come. And that's what we look forward to. And as believers, it should remind us, as Paul is trying to, that, temper, that, that suffering is very temporary. It's not eternal suffering. That one day, it will give way to this eternal glory. There will be no more pain, no more death, no more tears, no more suffering. We'll get to be with our Heavenly Father forever. So as believers, we groan. We cry out, Lord, come, take us home, redeem us. Uh, pick us back up and take us, take us up there with you. Uh, we want to be with you. Yet not only that, Paul then reminds us that the Holy Spirit he's given us, or that God has given us inside of us, is groaning as well. 
And he mentions that here in verses 26 uh, through 30. And so we pick up here in verse 26. He says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. We'll pause there. So the Holy Spirit groans within us as well. Why? Uh, Because God is concerned with his people. Uh, God is concerned with us. Um, I mean, when you take a look at the life of Jesus, uh, he was always concerned with those who were the least, the last, and the lost. Uh, You remember, I think it's in John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. Uh, They were ready, the religious leaders were ready to stone her to death. And they try and trap Jesus. Jesus, you know, you're a teacher of the law. You know the law. Uh, What do you say about this woman? And he bends down and writes something on the ground. We're not sure what he writes. Perhaps the Ten Commandments or the sin uh, of the people around. Um, But ultimately, he stands up and says, He who is without sin cast the first stone. His heart wasn't to see this woman killed, but redeemed and restored. And eventually they all leave one by one. It says the eldest to the younger. I think that's because the older you get, the more you realize the more sinful life we've had. Um, And so at the end, when everyone is gone, Jesus turns to this woman and says, Where are are those who accuse you? And she says, Nowhere. They've left. And he says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And so Jesus' heart is for um, those who are, are hurting, those who are going through times of suffering. And remember at one point when Jesus was um, looking over the city of Jerusalem, it says that his heart was broken. He cried, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. If you only know the day of your visitation, as a mother hen gathers her chicks, so I've longed to gather you, yet you were not willing. His heart was that his people, the Jews, would want to come to him and, and be gathered together. And yet they rejected him. And his heart was broken. So God is concerned not only about his people, but also about the trials that we go through. So in verses 26 to 30 here, we're reminded in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit groans with us and fills the burdens of our weaknesses and our suffering. But that it also says the Spirit does more than just groaning and, and, and a crying out from within us. I love what it says here. It says that uh, the Holy Spirit is also interceding for us, right? That he's praying for us so that we might be led into the will of God. Now, uh, I'll even confess this as a pastor. I don't always know what to pray for. I know God's uh, general will, and I know uh, several times the Scripture says this is the will of God for you, you like your sanctification in Christ Jesus. Um, But other times, from day to day, we may not always know his specific will for us in that moment. And yet, this is the awesome thing, is that it says God's Holy Spirit within us is interceding for us. That we might live in the will of God, in spite of the suffering and the trials and the things that we go through. And I, I, I appreciate that, because there's times where I begin a prayer and, and my, my thoughts just wander. And I think, what was I praying about again? But the Holy Spirit is right there within me, uh, praying and interceding on my behalf to the Lord in perfect harmony. And so, uh, the Holy Spirit inside of us shares the burden. And at times of suffering and trial, we need to remember that God is at work and that He has a perfect plan. Now, we may never fully understand that plan uh, on this side of eternity, but I think in heaven we will. Uh, I think in heaven we'll see why we're going through these, t- these trials and these times uh, of, of hard, uh, hard times that we go through. But ultimately, God has two purposes in that plan. One is for our own good, right? He's, he's changing and transforming us to become more like Christ. And the second is His glory, right? Because ultimately, He wants to make us more like Jesus Christ. And eventually, He will when we get into heaven. 
It's called the glorification. We'll be in a glorified body. We can never sin again. Uh, we'll live in perfect harmony with the Spirit He's given us, and we'll, we'll live with God for eternity. And so that's God's plan. And the best of all is that it's going to succeed, right? The Scripture tells us that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So he started the work. He saved us. He's rescued us. He's changed and transforming us. And then one day, either through the rapture or when he calls us to go home, we're going to be glorified. We're going to be with him forever. Um, and so this is, this is the truth that Paul lays out here. And specifically here in, in, in verse 28, uh, that's what he's talking about. The, this will of God, he expands upon that thought. And he says here in verse 28, in Romans 8, verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Now this is such a beautiful verse uh, in times that when we go through trials and suffering and, and heartache. And I want to encourage you, if you don't have this verse memorized, memorize this verse. <laughs> I remember doing that as a, as a baby Christian. And I am so grateful because the Holy Spirit has brought that back to my memory over and over again. Uh, you know, that, that God, is, God is in control. That God is working things out. And and, and I love looking at the Old Testament and, and looking at that verse applied to that. And you take a look at the life of Joseph, right? I mean, he's, he's betrayed by his brothers and sold to Egypt. And you think, well, Lord, how are you working this out for good? And then there's this false accusation with Potiphar's wife. And he's put in prison. And you think, okay, it's getting from bad to worse to ugly. This is not very good, right? Where are you, Lord? And then we can jump to the end of the story. Where we realize, right, that God was working all, it all out for good. That uh, there was the Pharaoh having these dreams and some of his servants. And Joseph was able to interpret those dreams and eventually become the, uh, the second in command of all of Egypt. And that God used all of that to rescue his people. So God is working things out for good. And we need to be reminded of that when we go through uh, trials, even the painful ones. So again, I want to encourage you to memorize this verse. Uh, and, and let God bring it to your remembrance. Um, and again, I need to remind ourselves that God's primary objective is not to make us happy, but to make us holy. And so we go through stuff in this life. Um, we don't always have happy times. Sometimes we do. Uh, but God's desire is to make us holy, to make us more like Him. And He can use the good and the bad. If we let him. So again, he wants to be glorified in our lives and make us more like Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is going to describe here next for us. And so um, in verses 28, 29, and 30, and this is called the golden chain of redemption. I'm not sure if you've ever heard that term before, but that's the theological term here is the golden chain of redemption. And so if one of these truths in these verses is true as a link, then the rest of them are true. Right, And so that's why it's called this golden chain of redemption. And so um, it starts here in verse 28, uh, that right, God is working things out for the good for those who love God. If you love God, that's you. And it says here, to those who are called according to his purpose. And then in verse 29 we read, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So it all started in eternity past when God chose us. God predestined those he knew would respond to his love and his grace. And he's predetermined that one day we would become more like his son. So people get confused on this. They, but the reality is predestination only um, is for people who are saved. And that's what this verse is saying, right? It doesn't say that he's uh, predestined uh, people to become saved. No, it says that he's predestined people to be conformed to the image of his Son. And so as soon as we receive Christ as our Savior and our Lord, and, we re and basically we're receiving the Holy Spirit inside of us at that point, that's that transformation, right? We're, we're being changed and transformed uh, to become more like Jesus Christ. And so uh, that's what this process is. So he saved us, right? Uh, and now he's predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. And some people, unfortunately, take this in the opposite direction. Uh, they say that, well, if God's predestined people to be conformed to the image of his son, does that therefore mean that God has predestined people not to be conformed to the image of his son and ultimately end up in hell? And the answer is no. Uh, that's my personal take, as, as I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. 
Uh, I don't think anywhere are we taught that God predestines people to be eternally condemned. Uh, because in John chapter 3, verses 18 through 21, uh, Christ tells us that if they're condemned, it's because they've refused to trust in God. They've, they're basically at the, this, this bottom of this well, and there's a rope out. Right? There, there's a ladder. There's a way to escape out of this pit, and that's through Jesus Christ, the way back to the Father. And yet, if they cut that rope, if they break that ladder, they're basically cutting off their only way of salvation. So, God's desire is that everyone would be saved, right? Second Peter uh, 3.9 tells us that God's not willing any perish, but all come to repentance. And then in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, not just the select few that He's chosen, but He's loved the world. He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes Him, not just those people that already know who are going to believe, but whosoever, whoever wants to believe in Him, will not perish but have everlasting life. So theologians debate and argue over this. Uh, on one side of the coin, there's God's sovereignty, that God is in control. He knows the end from the beginning. The other side of the coin is man's responsibility. And so, yes, God is sovereign, but we're also accountable. We also have responsibility. And I look at it this way. Um, you know, that God has initiated this process, right? That He has rescued us. He's, he's sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. We can either receive that or reject that offer. And so, if you're married, maybe this will make sense to you. But I remember uh, my wife, um, when I went to propose, and I had the ring in my pocket for a few weeks, trying to find the right time, and we went for a walk in California over um, a little bridge over the creek. And I got down on one knee, and I asked Anna, Will you marry me? Now, I've initiated the process. She has an opportunity to say yes or no. And I'm hoping, I'm pretty sure she's going to say yes. But she can still say no. I'm rejecting. I do not want to accept you. Uh, and we have that opportunity as well. God has chosen us. right? He, he desires that we would be in union with Him. Right? He's, he's got down on one knee, uh, so to speak, on the cross. He stepped down. A and He's inviting us to this relationship. We can say no. I want to live my way. Or we're going to say, you know what? I want to choose you back. And that's how I wrestle with that, is that God is sovereign, but I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to choose Him back. And so how do I know if I'm chosen? Choose God. If you choose God back, well, obviously you're chosen. So He's, he's chosen us in Christ Jesus. And you can read more about that in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5 as well. And so he's chosen us. And we continue here in verse 30. He says, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Uh, whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So those he chose, he called. Now he, he's called us. And uh, you can read more about that in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And basically it's talking about He's called us, right? And we need to respond to that call. He's, he's, God is always the initiator. We simply respond. Uh, we've talked about this with, uh, with serving, right? Is that we don't serve God to manipulate Him. We don't serve God to get Him in that, that choke hole, the neck hole, and go, all right, God, I did this for you. You owe me now, right? It doesn't work that way. We serve Him in response. We serve go, Lord. I was heading to, to death and, and hell, and you saved me and, and rescued and redeemed me. What can I do for you? How can I, how can I live a life in response to that love you've demonstrated for me? So God always initiates. We respond. He's calling us, right? Will we respond to that call? And then he's justified. Um, he says that he's, that he's not only uh, uh, called, but he's also justified. Now, we talked about this uh, a while back. Uh, the word justification it means just as if I never sinned. Just as if I never done anything wrong. And that's really mind-boggling. It blows my mind to think that God looks at me and goes, You know, Tim, I look at you and I see Christ. I, 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 don't, I, I don't see any sin. I go, Well, that's amazing, Lord, because I know I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. <laughs> I know that I, I, I blow it. I know that I sin against my wife and my kids and, and people around me. I know I sin against you, Lord. Uh, yet you're telling me that you look at me as just as if I never sinned. Because I'm in your son, Christ Jesus. You look at me and you see Jesus. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, I don't fully um, understand how God can see me that way, but that's what his word says. He sees me that way. And I'm grateful. 
uh, that he can look at me and say, you're justified. I look at you just as if you never sinned. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, we sin against the Lord, that we shouldn't confess that sin. Um, because justification is talking about our eternal security. But, you know, and I've, I've shared this before with my wife, is that we're married, right? I know that if I don't come home one night, uh, and I come home the next day, and uh, that she's not going to say, I'm leaving you, right? Because we love each other. We've made that commitment before God and before others. Um, but that's going to get in, in our relationship. It's going to hinder our closeness, right? She's going to have some questions for me. Where were you? What were you doing? I was home with the kids. Why didn't you help? Uh, you know, I need your help. You know, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause a little bit of a separation. And that's what sin does. And so if we sin against God, it's not that we've lost our salvation, but the reality is, is that we've lost that intimacy, that closeness. So 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins... He being God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we have that re restored relationship. So God has called us. He has justified us. But then this blows my mind too here, is what it says, is in whom he justified, these he also glorified. So for us, we're awaiting this glorification. We're awaiting that we get a new body when we get to heaven and, and, and we get this glorification uh, process, this glorified body where our body will never want to sin. Our body will never fall down and deteriorate. It will never have um, anything wrong with it ever again. It will last forever. Yet God is telling us that we are glorified. And so this means the believer has already been glorified in Christ. Uh, remember John 17, 22, uh, that we will be glorified, not in our own selves, but glorified in Christ Jesus. So the revelation of this glory is that we're awaiting the coming of the Lord. Um, but God already knows the beginning from the end, right? It's like this, this parade. Uh, when, you're, when you're down on the sidewalk, you can see the parade as it comes by. You can see the beginning, the middle, and the end. But God's like up in one of those big blimps. He's looking down and he sees the whole, the whole scale of time. He sees that parade go by. He can see the beginning, the middle, and the end all, all at once. So he knows the end from the beginning. So he calls the shots. He gives us promises that we can hold on to. He says that we are glorified. We're glorified in Christ Jesus. Um, so, God watches our lives. And it's as if He were watching almost a rerun. Because He knows what we're going to do. So again, God chooses us. He called us. He justified us. And glorified us. Now, this should let you know that God is for you. Right? He's for you. And He's for us. The world, the flesh, and the devil are against us. But they're no match for God. God is for us. He's on our side. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And that's what Paul's going to expand on next in this, this latter section here in verses 31 through 39. That God is for us. Uh, and so in this, this latter section here, this final section we'll look at, it's really on the security of the believer. We don't need to fear the past, the present, or the future. Because we're secure in the love of Christ. And so as we read verses 31 through 39, uh, Paul is going to present these five arguments, these five declarations of truth to prove that there could be no separation between us who are saved and our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pick up here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 and we read, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. 
For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We'll take a look at these five declarations, these truths, these five arguments that Paul makes here to prove that there could be no separation between us who are saved and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's really declaring that we have this freedom from fear and this freedom from ever being separated from our God. And the first one here is in verse 31. He mentions that if God is for us, who can be against us? He's declaring this truth that God is for us, right? He's chosen us, He's redeemed us, He's justified us, He's glorified us from heaven's perspective. He's for us. So God is for us. Who can be against us? And so even if we feel abandoned by everyone else in the world, friends, family, co-workers, um, maybe even a spouse at one point has left you and you feel abandoned and alone, God is there with you. He is for you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And we need to enter, I think, each new day realizing that God is for us. There is no need to fear because our Heavenly Father loves His children. He knows what's best for us. And even if we have to go through trials to receive His best, we cling to God's promise. Just as we cling to this promise in, in, in verse 28 that we know God works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purposes. I want to encourage you to memorize this other verse, if you don't already know it, Jeremiah 29, 11. That's kind of the Old Testament uh, verse of this Romans uh, eight twenty eight verse. Um, and that says that God declares, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. So God says, I know the plans I have for you. It's not for evil. It, it's for good. It's not to to take away your life. It's to give you a life full of meaning and a purpose of a future and a hope. And so we need to re remind ourselves of this first promise that God is for us. And then the second promise he, he mentions here, the second um, argument to prove that nothing can separate us from God is in verse 32, that Christ died for us. And he says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So he's trying to remind us here that God has proved his love for us, that he's died on the cross for us, right? It's, it's that gospel message of love uh, that drew us to the Lord, right? That Christ died on the cross for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So... Paul's making this argument here. And he's really arguing from the lesser to the greater. If when we were sinners, Christ died for us, right? He gave his, his all for us, his best for us. Now that we're in Christ, is it going to be less than that? No, it's going to be more than that. And that's what he's trying to, is, is to remind us here, is that he's going to give us what we need. He's going to help us. He's going to uh, make sure that we make it safely to heaven. In fact, Jesus used this same argument when he tried to convince people that it was foolish to worry and fear. He reminded them that God cares for the, the birds, right, uh, of the air, and that we're more valuable, more valuable than the birds. He, and then he talked about the lilies of the field, that even Solomon in all his splendor wasn't arrayed and dressed like one of those. And so who are we to be fearful? He's, he's, he's using this logic to remind us that he cares for us. So God is dealing with us on his own basis of Calvary's grace. Not on the basis of the law, but on the basis of his love. And so God freely gives us all things in Christ Jesus to help us to become more like him, to grow. And so Christ has died for us. And then the third here is that God has justified us. We talked about this a moment ago. And he says that here in verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies Again, the word justified means just as if we never sinned. So that means that he has declared us righteous in Christ. God looks at us just as if we never sinned. But we know that Satan will accuse us and condemn us, right? Uh, and sometimes that happens so we condemn ourselves as we go, man, you blew it. 
You are a lousy Christian. You might as well just give up now. You might as well just run, go put your head in the sand, and, and, and go back to your old ways. The Lord doesn't love you anymore. He, you know, he's got other people that love him more. That's the enemy. He wants to condemn us and beat us up. He wants to drive us further away from the Lord and accuse us and take us out. But God has already justified us. He's already set us free. The enemy has no control over our salvation. God has already won. He's already justified us. And I believe an understanding of this meaning of justification will bring peace to our hearts. We'll realize that God looks at me just as if, if I've never done anything wrong. And we know that as, as believers, um, our experience changes from day to day. But justification never changes. We, you know, we, we can never do anything to lose our salvation. We can never do anything to lose that love from the Lord. And we may accuse ourselves. Others may accuse us. But God will never take us to court and accuse us. He's already won our salvation. He's already freed us. He's already paid the price for the penalty that we deserved. And not only that, but then He secured us in Him. No one can take us out of His hand. So, um, who's going to bring a charge against us? No one. Because God has justified us. And then the fourth truth that Paul mentions here is in verse 34. And it says, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes, who also makes intercession uh, for us. So the fourth one here is that Christ intercedes for us. Now this is kind of a dual intercession because we, we talked about this uh, in verses 26 through 27, that the Spirit is interceding for us, right? He's groaning out from within us, uh, bringing us closer to the will of God and helping us be in the will of God. But then it also, here in this verse, we see that the Son of God Himself intercedes for us here in verse 34. So we have this dual intercession that keeps us secure in Christ and reminds us, reminds us of that security. And so the same Savior who died for us is now interceding for us in heaven. And He's interceding for us as our high priest. And so we, we know that... Um, he loves us and that he's interceding for us. And I was reminded, I, I love looking at, at the life of the apostles, especially Peter. I think I relate to him a little bit more than Paul. Um, and Peter, he sinned against the Lord, but he was forgiven. And then he, later he was restored to the fellowship. He remember, he denied the Lord three times. And then the Lord publicly restored him three times. And before all of that, uh, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Listen up. Satan has asked permission to sift you all like wheat. But I have prayed, especially for you, that your own faith may not utterly fail. What was Jesus saying? Peter, uh, Satan wants to take you guys all out. But I've prayed. Not only prayed, i prayed especially for you. <laughs> because he knew what was going to happen. And so Christ was interceding for Peter before even the sin went down. Christ is interceding for each of us as well. And this is his ministry, and it assures us that we're secure in Christ. That he's, he's interceding. He's, he's cheering us on. He's on our side. He's, he's longing for us to become more like him. Now, the difference between Satan's condemnation and the Holy Spirit's conviction is that condemnation is driving that wedge between us and the Lord. Satan wants to take us away and get us to feel defeated and discouraged. Uh, the Holy Spirit does the opposite, convicts us of our spirit, or excuse me, of our sin, and, and then drives us to the Lord to make things right. So we're secure in the Lord. Um, and we may feel unworthy from this condemnation from the enemy, but the conviction for us to go back to God, to confess our sins, to make things right. Reminds us, yeah, we may feel unworthy, but in Christ we're worthy because He loves us. So again, Jesus does not want to condemn us. He's pleading our case. He's interceding for us. It's like you're in the courtroom, and and the devil is is the guy that's accusing you and bringing all these charges against you, and you're just sitting there, and and Jesus goes, yeah, mm -hmm, yep, I know all that. And then says to the Father, you know what? Uh, his charges are true, but guess what? I already paid for this man's crime. And he's, he's already been set free. Uh, and so he's free to go. 
You know, and that's that's what happens. The devil's the accuser of the brethren. He continues to accuse us and beat us up and condemn us. But Christ intercedes for us. He'll never stop. He he intercedes for us. Because he's chosen us. He loves us. And so um, nothing's going to separate us. And that's the fifth one here in verses 35 through 39. All right, we read, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he lists all these things. And in verse 37 he says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So he said, Nothing can separate us from this love of God. But suppose some great trial or temptation comes and we utterly fail like Peter and we go, Lord, I've sinned against you. Is God going to stop loving us? No. Nothing can separate us from his love. And Paul deals with that problem here in this final section. He really just expands upon this, that nothing can separate us from the love of, of Jesus Christ. Now again, sin will hinder our relationship, hinder our fellowship with the Lord. Um... Sin is an ugly thing. It's a thing deserving of death, but Christ has taken our sin upon Him on the cross. So when we sin, it hinders our closeness, but it'll never stop Him from loving us. And if you've got kids, you understand that. There's times you want to pull your hair out and you go, Lord, why did you give me these little rascals? Right? They're little sinners. And they're breaking stuff and doing things they shouldn't. They're disobedient. But you love them because they're yours. Now, when you're in the grocery store and you see another kid acting out, you may want to say something to that parent or to that child, um, but usually it's not out of love for that child. (laughs) It's because you want to see that child, you know, be disciplined. You want to see them stop misbehaving. But when it's our kids, we love them. And there's nothing they can ever do to stop us from loving them. And, And that's true of our Heavenly Father. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. And that's what he says. Who shall separate us from this love of Christ? Nothing can. Nothing can stop God from loving us. And I love what it says here in verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I love what the Greek is implying here. It literally is saying that we are super conquerors through Christ Jesus. That he gives us victory and more victory and more victory. Not because of ourselves, but because we're in Christ. He's conquering the things in our life. He's conquered sin and death, and He's conquering all the stuff that we go through. And so we do not lose heart. We do not lose hope because we're in Christ Jesus, and He is for us. He loves us. And so He tells us here that He is persuaded in verse 38 that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities. And He's contrasting things here so that principalities, in the context, He's talking about the demonic realm. Uh, demons or fallen angels, if you will. Nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I love that this is a promise with, with no conditions attached. It's not like, hey, if you do this, then God will do this for you. But this is our security in Christ. It's an established fact, and we can claim it for ourselves. Not because of our own merit or anything we can do for Christ, but because of what Christ has done for us. Nothing can separate you from His love. And and I think we need to believe it, we need to receive it, and rejoice in that. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Nothing. And that should motivate us to want to go out and tell people, Hey man, Jesus loves you. And I know there's some churches, some so-called Christian groups that forbid that. Uh, Because, again, they think if you're not one of God's chosen, you don't want to confuse people that they might not be chosen. And how do you know that God really loves them? Well, I'm pretty clear. I think the Bible's pretty clear. He loves all of us. He desired all of us to come back to that personal relationship with Him. So we can go out and we can declare, hey, Jesus loves you. He loves me? I'm a sinner. Yeah, He loves you. He loves you enough to not want to let you stay in the, in the sin you're in. He wants to save you and redeem you and transform your life. So we need to remind ourselves that nothing can separate us from God's love. We need to believe that, receive it, and rejoice in it. So in conclusion, we are free from judgment because Christ has died for us. So we have His righteousness. We're clothed in His righteousness. We are free from defeat. Because Christ lives in us by His Holy Spirit, and we share His life. 
We are free from discouragement because Christ is coming for us soon and we shall share His glory. And we are free from fear because Christ intercedes for us and we can never be separated from His love. Now, I do need to mention this, that, that these verses are for believers only. If you're saved, nothing can separate you from God's love. If you're not saved, um, well, God has to be a just and perfect judge. If you had committed a crime and you went to the, the courtroom and, and you stood before the judge and said, you know, um, I hope you can let this slide. I'm a nice person. I, I give money to the church. I help people. Uh, I help the old lady across the street. I open the door for her as well. Uh, I'm a pretty nice guy. I volunteer. I do all these nice things for people. Is that judge, if he's a just judge, he's going to say, well, yeah, you murdered somebody. I'm just going to let you go because you're such a nice guy. No. If he's a just judge, he's got to say, you know what? You've committed the crime. There's a penalty for your crime. And God's a just judge. One sin is enough to send us to hell. And so a just judge won't overlook a crime. So in Christ, we have that forgiveness. We have that salvation. For those who, who've rejected Christ, um, they're separated from that love of God. God loves them, but they need to receive that love. They need to receive Him as their Lord and their Savior. And so with that, let's pray. Lord, we thank You so much for this time that we can come together and, and um, study Your Word, Lord, that we can see just how much You love us. Father, we thank You that um, we have this freedom from discouragement and from despair, uh, that we know that creation is groaning and crying out for this redemption. And Lord, as believers, we cry out too. We, we long to be at home with You, to be out of this wicked world where everything's falling apart and getting worse and worse, Lord. We, we desire to be with You. And the Holy Spirit You've given us, Lord, is desiring that as well. And Father, we thank You for the freedom from the fear and that freedom now knowing that we'll never be separated from you for those of us who are in you Christ Jesus we thank you that you love us so much we thank you that you're for us thank you that you died for us that you've justified us that you're interceding for us even right now I thank you that you always and will continue to always love us and Father we pray that if there be any here this morning or those listening later on to this message online that if they don't know you as their Savior and as their Lord, that you would move on their hearts, Lord, to repent of their sins, to realize they've been heading the wrong direction, that they turn around and come back home to you. And as they come back home to you, that they'd understand that you're not there waiting to beat them up and tell them how messed up they've been, but your arms are wide open, ready to receive them and hug them and embrace them and say, Welcome home, my child. I've been longing for this moment. I've been praying for you. I have been interceding on your behalf, calling you home, wailing and ready to forgive you. And Lord, we desire to see people come to know you. And so if that's you, I want to just encourage you to cry out to the Lord and, and to repeat this prayer after me. You can repeat that in your own heart. You're simply declaring that you want Jesus Christ to come inside of you and make you a new person to save you and give you His forgiveness. If that's you, just go ahead and repeat this after me. Lord, I realize that I'm a sinner. And I realize today my need for you. I see now that I can never get to heaven on my own. And I understand that this is why you set your son Jesus to come to this earth, to live that perfect sinless life I never could. And I understand that he died on that cross for my sins that he was buried with my sins in that tomb. And I'm thankful for the third day he rose from the dead. And I receive the life that he offers. I receive this forgiveness. I ask that you would come into my heart, into my life right now. Make me a new person. Wash me clean of all my wrongs, of all my sins. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to live in a way that pleases you, God. I thank you for being my Savior and my Lord. I thank you for loving me and for dying for me. And I thank you for being my friend. I love you and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
If that's you and you prayed to receive Christ today, I want to encourage you to come let me know. Let somebody know that you gave your life to Jesus Christ. No greater decision you can ever make than to yield your life to the one who loved you enough to die on the cross for you.